Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thank you for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring thought leaders in the career and personal growth arena. You spend a significant portion of your life at work, so I'm on a mission to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I am delighted to welcome my very special guest to the show today, Maurice Schweitzer. Maurice, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks for having me. Hey, I'm really excited to talk about your amazing book, and I want to tell our audience all about you. Maurice Schweitzer is the author of Friend and Foe, When to Cooperate, When to Compete, and How to Succeed at Both, and the Cecilia Yen Ku Professor of Operations, Information, and Decisions at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on emotions, ethical decision-making, and the negotiation process. He has published in management, psychology, and economics journals, such as the Academy of Management Journal, the Journal of Applied Psychology, Management Science, Organizational Behavior, and Human Decision Processes, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Psychological Science, and the American Economic Review. So Maurice, really excited to dig into this juicy conversation conversation about the book, but let's start with the basics. In relationships, we think of ourselves as either competitive or cooperative, but your research has found that this isn't so. So tell me why. Yeah, great question. We we like to categorize people. So we categorize people as friends or foes, and we do this at a very young age. We even think about categorizing people as girls or boys. We, we love categories, but it turns out that the categories we have are often too coarse. Mm. And so at work, we think about people as our friends or our foes, but really we go back and forth collaborating and competing with the exact same people. Now, see, I find that interesting because it tells us we go right back, right? So unpack, was this just a personal interest of yours or was it research-based? What, what drove you to write this book? Well, it started with, uh, I, I teach negotiations and I started an advanced negotiation class at the Wharton School. And as I think about negotiations, we... We negotiate with people all the time, and I think of negotiations with a small n. So we we negotiate with our kids, we negotiate with our spouses, not just the formal negotiations when we say buy a house or a car or negotiate our salary, but we're constantly negotiating as we go through life. And we're trying to advance our own interests, but really the best way to do that is to figure out what you really need. And there's an element of collaboration and competition. And I think it's really inherent, not just in negotiations, but throughout our social experience. So clearly this is essential in work and in life. Oh, absolutely. So I think this has direct application for work. I I teach at the Wharton School and I teach MBAs and undergraduate majors in business. But I also think that through our social experience, I mean, from our siblings to the way we deal with our spouses to deal, the way we deal with our kids, we're, we're constantly navigating this tension as we collaborate and compete. And you know what I find interesting? Quite often, the um, the concept of negotiation is all about the deal, right? Whether it is the business person or the lawyer. And what I'm hearing you say is we negotiate and navigate our way through relationships in life for any number of things. And part of this is even the way we communicate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I think I think we often think of negotiation as this very special experience when we're striking a big deal. But and that's true, but the negotiations we do all the time, um, and sometimes without even thinking about it, are the small negotiations, and that's really what makes up our life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I loved how you said very, very simply and authentically, you know, what do you need, right? And and that's really a basic instinct. Well, exactly. I mean, I think, it, you know, it starts with trying to take somebody else's perspective to figure out what's important to you. And I need to ask you questions. I need to listen actively and carefully. 
And if I figure out what you're trying to do, I can see where my interests fit in. And we're going to have points of friction, but we'll also have points of commonality and we can build towards something that makes us both better off. And that's the whole idea. That's the whole premise. So let's talk a little bit about power. So one area where we do compete with others is is for power. So how does power affect people and how do we fall from power? Sure. Uh, well, it turns out we're all trying to gain power. So we work long hours. We try to ingratiate ourselves with the right people. We work very hard to accumulate status and power. And within any human social group, there is a hierarchy. We might think of ourselves as a flat organization, or we might think of ourselves as all equals, but there's a hierarchy, and we might jockey around for position, but we end up finding our place in it. Now, here's what's interesting about power. Power is something we desire because we have all these great rewards when we have it, Uh but when we feel powerful, It changes the way we think and the way we behave. In some ways, it changes us for the better. When people are powerful, they're more likely to approach, take action, to do things. They're disinhibited. Yeah. So if there's something that I'm, I've been, you know, reluctant to go out and do, when I feel powerful, I take action, I strike, I, I pursue my goals. When I'm feeling low in power, I'm much more careful, much more reticent, more hesitant. So in in many cases, power is great, but also power causes us to feel less concern for other people. And this this manifests itself in a couple of ways, but I think one of the most important is perspective taking. We tend to think less about other people's interests. Mm -hmm. And when we're in a position of power, we feel sometimes invincible and also sometimes invisible where we don't really think that other people are as aware of our behaviors as they really are. Now, now let me let me dive in and say as the career coach, you know, my antenna are up and I'm hearing similarities with your definition of power and also confidence, right? Or is confidence a benefit of feeling your power? Well, that's right. So when we feel powerful, we're going to be more confident and more prone to action. When we feel disempowered, we lack confidence and we're more hesitant, we're less likely to pursue our goals. And in general, we want confidence. We'd like to marry confidence with perspective taking and the ability to think about other people around us. Power, the the one problem with power is it often blinds us And we become much less sensitive. So do you believe that that all people inherently seek power or is power a value that we prioritize or or don't prioritize? Well, there are definitely individual differences. There are people that are far more sensitive to it and, uh, and find the allure of it stronger than others. But in any relationship, even even our closest relationships, we're always jockeying for some position uh, to find our our place in a hierarchy. And some people are more comfortable with with a less powerful position. But but for all of us, we all recognize many of the rewards that go along with power. So good segue. Let's talk about hierarchies. And I'd, I'd love to hear about if your research really informed and impacted the debate currently about whether hierarchies or holocracies are more effective workplaces. Yeah, the, it turns out that hierarchies are incredibly effective in basically bonding a group of people together to pursue a goal. We think about some of the sharpest hierarchies like the military. Mm -hmm. The military is a very strong hierarchy. It allows the coordination of a lot of people under stress to perform sets of actions. Everybody plays a role and we're achieving some larger purpose. Or you think about the Catholic Church, the Pope uh, you know, is visiting the United States now. Right, right. That uh, the Catholic Church 
is an incredibly hierarchical organization, and it's persisted over millennia in part because the very strong hierarchy helps people understand what their place is, what their role is, and it coordinates action in a way that can be very effective. Now, we've seen this trend towards people trying to diminish hierarchy because hierarchy has some problems. It turns out people at the bottom don't speak up. They don't share their ideas. And people at the top sometimes are blind to the information and the different voices around them. And so they miss out on information that's trapped within the, within the crowd. So, so we think about this sort of uh, phenomenal opportunity to break down a hierarchy. The problem is that we lack coordination when we do that. And, and what we found um, is that there's some types of tasks where hierarchy is very good. If the tasks are simple, if there are huge benefits from coordination, hierarchy is going to be a big advantage. When individuals work relatively independently, when creativity is important, when new ideas are important, breaking down hierarchy will help. So I mentioned, for example, the military. The military is extremely hierarchical, but there's actually one branch of the military where they've broken down that hierarchy, and that's in the special forces. And in the special forces, they've broken down that hierarchy. People can talk back to the commander because they're entrusting people to share ideas and be more creative as they pursue goals together. Is it the immediacy, the you know, the real time life and death decision making and the the innovation in the special forces? You know, I'm I'm wondering how how that can be distinguished differently in the military at large. Well, it's it's the innovation, the creativity, uh, where we want autonomy, where people can act more independently. So in the special forces, they're very small groups. Mm. The military, let's say you think about the army or the navy, uh, they're coordinating a lot of people, and and people are not that independent for for an entire army to move for. Uh, a ship to move. We need everybody in their place doing their part, and and there the hierarchy is going to be much more effective. Got it. Got it. So let's talk about men and women. And I am I'm fascinated by how we maneuver in the work pl- workplace differently. So why do we demand women to be cooperative, and what becomes of them when they act too competitive in the workplace? Yeah, interesting question. We've looked at a lot of gender differences, and there's a raging debate, you know, are these differences innate, are they biological, or are they social? And what we've come to the conclusion is that most of these differences are really socially induced. Um, and, And you see strong differences, for example, in math performance across different states in the United States, across different countries. And those differences really reflect how conservative the values are in those cultures. The more liberal the states, the more liberal the countries, the smaller the gap in, for example, math performance on standardized tests between genders. And in some very liberal places, you actually see women doing better than men. So it suggests that it's not really an innate difference, but something that's socially constructed. And a lot of our social expectations reflect the idea that we expect women to be communal, to be kind, to be sharing, to be warm. And we expect men to be more assertive and more aggressive. And because of that, we we find people that act out of character, out of our expectations. We find them to be weird or having violated some some sort of unwritten social norm. And I think that causes people to conform. So we, we end up finding that, that women often behave in communal, kind, sharing ways and sometimes don't advance their self-interest. But there's some interesting exceptions to that. So you think about women lawyers, for example. We expect them to be kind and caring, but when they're advocating for somebody else... We, we want them to be fierce. Them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
and the mama bear. So imagine, you know, the mother advocating for their child. We expect that mother to be assertive, aggressive when they're advocating for somebody else. But it's kind of curious that is when they're advocating for themselves, they can suffer backlash for yeah. being too assertive. Now, do you see this changing? And, and, and let me let me add something to that. You know, I'm I'm fascinated by this debate and certainly by the research behind it. And I think we are moving the needle slowly. I think we are celebrating women in leadership roles and that nature of collaboration, being cooperative, being excellent listeners, being empathetic has empowered women to be very successful leaders, different leaders than men, certainly, but those uh, collaborative skill sets have, have proven to be very successful. Do we see more of the socially acceptable competitive woman in the workplace? now? Or do you think we're still going to keep that uh, nurture uh, caricature in the next generation? Yeah, great question. I I think we're going to see things change, but change is slow. I mean, it's it's certainly slower than I'd like it to be. I have (laughs) have four daughters myself. Uh, I'd like to believe that they're going to enter a very different workplace, and it will be different. Certainly. Um, but, but we still find that women in the top echelons of management are, are very underrepresented. And we do find um, it's not just men, but it's also women that have expectations around, surrounding other women, and they expect them to be more communal, kind, and sharing. And when they see women that act aggressively, assertively, they also suffer backlash, not just because men are uncomfortable, but other women are too. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I that I do find encouraging, certainly many things, but here's one in particular. Uh, we we now have a generation of older, seasoned professional men, uh, many of whom are baby boomers, who have daughters in the workforce, uh-huh. and right. because they are experiencing through their daughters what kind of relationships, and you know, they come home and say, "Dad," or they call Dad and say, "You're not going to believe this happened," and the, and the Papa Bear, right, is 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 rearing up saying, wow, that's inappropriate behavior, or you need to be more competitive, you need to be more powerful. So it is changing the landscape, I believe. And it'd be interesting, yeah. I'm sure your your girls are, are much younger, but as we have more male figures with, with um, people in the workforce with whom they love that are part of their families, things are going to change. Yeah, that's a great point. In fact, you see that with uh, voting. So you see um, <laughs> you see men with daughters that, that vote differently than yeah. men without daughters. Right. So, right. so I'm sure that that idea is getting reflected back into the workplace. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So in the book, great book, every chapter ends with a section entitled Finding the Right Balance. So tell me about this and, and why it's important. Well, you think about, for example, we have chapters in the book on trust and deception. Mm-hmm. And deception's interesting because it basically hijacks a trusting system. Now, we, we need trust to collaborate, to share information, to, to work in synchrony. But there are some people that hijack that trust and exploit us. And we want to make sure that we trust so we gain those benefits from collaboration. But we're not overly trusting in a way that makes us subject to exploitation. And so we need to find our balance. We need to figure out how we're doing, what kind of information we should be sharing or not sharing as we navigate, I think, a very complicated social landscape where, and I think this is something the book really helps us do, is think more explicitly about the dynamic relationship of our friends. That is, we're we're collaborating in some domains um, so we work together to achieve some project, to accomplish some goal. But then we're also in competition as we're fighting for recognition, promotion, raises, that we go back and forth. And collaborations, you know, the general rule, and that's what's going to get us ahead. But we have to be careful about competition and recognize that there are some times when we should be competing. And I think the Serena and Venus Williams yes. rivalry is just the quintessential uh, they they navigate this so pitch perfectly 
where you see them competing on the court, but also collaborating when they play doubles. And then at the end of a very difficult match between them, they'll give each other a very sweet hug and, and you can see how much they really care about each other. And they go back and forth in a way that I think should inspire all of us. And I love that illustration because it really isn't uh, this equal balance that is constant. There's an ebb and a flow, right? There's a rise right. and a fall. Right. And it, I, I think it, I just think of, of work-life balance and that phrase frustrates me because it, it implies that it can be even keel all the time. And I don't believe it can. I think the nature of, uh, navigating life and work is that there are difficult times and then there are less difficult times. So similarly, balance is relative, right? And there's an ebb and flow to it. Yeah. In fact, I really like your phrasing of the ebb and flow. Uh, and perhaps we should go back in the next edition of the book and change it from balance to ebb and flow. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Maurice, what a joy to have you on. Tell us how we can buy the book. And I want to remind the audience... Oh, Friend Thank and you. Foe. Yeah, Friend uh, and Foe. Friend and Foe, it's available through every book, set, book retailer from Amazon to Barnes & Noble to Google. Uh, you can find it. It's available uh, as a hardback. There's a Kindle edition. There's an audio edition. It, uh, it's gone on sale in the UK. It's, uh, of course, here in the United States. Fantastic. Um, my, uh, my Twitter handle is M-E underscore Schweitzer. I'd love to hear feedback about the book, and I, uh, I'm really excited about the opportunity to think about our relationships as friend and foe. Excellent. Hey, I want to give a plug to the audiobook. I have become an audiobook fan. I find that I can read, in air quotes, listen to more books that way. And it is such a such a joyful experience to have someone read oh, well, to me. Thank yeah. So thank you for that. I really, it's it's delightful. So uh, great way to uh, to enjoy a book. So I encourage everyone to check that out in whatever form inspires you. But Maurice, what a, what a pleasure to have you on. I wish you great success. And I hope our professional paths cross again. I look forward to it. Be well. And I want to thank all of you for tuning into your working life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. True career and life satisfaction is possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. I'm Caroline Dowd-Higgins. Take good care. (laughs) 